Hello and welcome to City Corner. I'm your host, Todd Blackstock. On today's show, Mike Puertas will discuss an amazing new club coming to the STL. And later, legendary DJ Randy Raley will join us to discuss music preservation here in St. Louis. So stay with us for City Corner, coming up next on STL TV. And welcome to the show. Our first guest today is the founder of what will soon be the world's largest indoor paddle and pickle club based right here in St. Louis. Mike Puertas, thank you for joining us today on City Corner. Thank you, Todd. You know, pickleball is becoming one of the fastest growing sports across the nation, across the world, and everybody wants to play it. What is the big craze with pickleball? You know, pickleball is such a great game because um, anybody can pick it up. It's very easy to learn. Um, it, it doesn't require extreme athleticism to get out there and have fun. It's social. Everybody's looking at each other in a doubles format. Um, it, it just it, it hits all the buttons on having fun, playing sports, and being social, and just people love it. And then it's uh, also the paddle club. So mm -hmm. you've got paddle, and some people call it padel. Correct. And then there's pickleball. So you have... Uh, two different sports. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit similar, but you did bring some some props here to show us Absolutely. the difference. If you could maybe yes. show us the rackets Absolutely. here and uh, what the difference is. So here we have a padel paddle. Um, make sure this ball doesn't fall off the table. Uh, we have a padel paddle, and this is a much thicker um, paddle than the pickleball, and it's played with a tennis ball with slightly less pressure in it. It's also played inside of a court which has glass walls and cage. Um, it's very similar to, to tennis, squash, racquetball. Um, you use all aspects of that sport, and it's the fastest growing racket sport elsewhere in the world. So that's, uh, that's the padel paddle. And over here, more people are familiar with this. This is the pickleball paddle. The pickleball paddle. Absolutely. It's thinner. It's uh, hardcore graphite, and you use essentially, uh, it's a pickleball, but people will be familiar with the wiffle ball. It's very similar to that. Yeah. So... Two different looking rackets or paddles and balls, but um, both sports are extremely social. Both sports are fun. Both sports are easy to pick up. Now, it sounds like you've come from across the sea, from across the pond in England. What brought you to the United States? Um, I was a professional squash player playing on the, the squash tour worldwide, and I played several events in the U.S. each year, and I really fell in love with the, the, the States. Um, I decided once I was wrapping up my pro squash career, that I would come to the States and, and teach. So that's how I ended up coming over here. You know, we're gonna jump ahead before we go back mm -hmm. a little bit. So you've come here and you were quite successful as a squash player. Yes. Uh, winning lots of tournaments and I was doing some research and you had a couple of St. Louis Cardinal baseball players that you were uh, helping out and tutoring a little bit and a number one national champion, a woman as well. Yes, so um, I had a friend who was involved with the Cardinals, and uh, in the off-season, they wanted to train a few of the players. And uh, he introduced me to uh, David Fries and Matt Holliday. So I took them onto a squash court and worked them out with some different drills, and it was a lot of fun. They, they, they did some fairly extreme athletic stuff, as you can imagine. Um, but uh, they enjoyed it, and it was great off-season training for them in the day. Um, the uh, former professional that I coached at the time was based in St. Louis for about a year and a half. Her name's Natalie Granger, and she got to number one in the world while she was here in St. Louis, and we were training together. So that was a, a wow. pretty cool. So you stayed here after uh, training those individuals, and you really helped Washington University out. I understand you were both the men and women's uh, squash coach, and I believe you were the first one ever. Correct. Yes, I was actually approached by a squash player who moved to St. Louis, who was a student at WashU, and said, hey, we don't have squash here. Can you help us out? So we together put um, the men's and women's squash team um, together as a, as a club team. We attended all the national championships, and I was there for 10 years running both the men's and women's squash teams. Wow. Well, thank you for doing that. Yeah, so it was fun. No credit. Uh, it seems like the racket sports, you know, you have squash, you've got tennis, now you've got padel and pickleball. Mm -hmm. If I'm starting out right now, I think I want to start in pickleball because 
it, it, it seems like you've got the wiffle ball there and you've got the smaller uh, racket mm -hmm. and you don't have to move quite as much. Is it, is it kind of a good way to ease into getting back in shape? Absolutely. It's a great way to get back into to getting in shape and, and getting out there and, and having fun playing a sport. Um, it, as I said, it's really, really easy to pick up. It's very hard to master. And, and similarly, Padel is easy to pick up and hard to master. So it really caters to every aspect of, of society from, you know, complete beginner to, to professional players. Now, if you're super aggressive, you probably don't want to play pickleball. Or if you're like, you know, in your 20s and mm -hmm. stuff, you can. Yep. But isn't it maybe designed and focused for a little older group? It, it definitely works well with the older groups because there isn't as much movement involved. Having said that, when, with singles pickleball, it, it still has quite a bit of athleticism involved. So, yes, it, it probably steers a little bit more towards the older group, and it, and it helps them continue to play athletic sports. And some of the rules are kind of funny. It's like there's this thing like you're not supposed to go into the kitchen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, is that like <laughs> the area in front of the net? That's what my wife tells me. <laughs> yeah, so it's the area in front of the net. So that area is blocked out. So you cannot just jump on the net and volley a ball hard at someone. Right. You have to stand behind that to take the ball in the air. If it bounces in there, then you're allowed to step in there and, and play that ball. Well, let's go back to the club. We're so excited. I mean, the world's largest paddle plus pickleball club in the U.S. Now, this is a club. This is a, a private club. It's not something you can just drive up and go to. There's certain things you have to do to be a member. Correct. We do. We, we allow guests, so guests will be able to come in and, and play at the club. There'll be a guest fee, obviously, but they'll be able to come in, see the club, walk around the club, play games, um, and then the rest of the, the, the membership will then also be involved in that process. So how many courts will there be? So we have 14 courts total. We have eight pickleball courts and uh, six padel courts. Uh, we have a big central bar. We have a full pro shop. We have pro staff. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a full service club. It's going to be a social hub. I grew up in the boom of squash in, in the 80s and 90s, and, and our social scene was you know, around the courts and, and the bar area with TVs, and, and that's what we're trying to recreate here with these two great sports. So it's a great social thing as well. Absolutely. So you can go out and you can, uh, you know, you can come you know, play a little social pickleball or mm -hmm. padel ball, and then you can go you know, grab something to eat or uh, you know, get a nice cold you know, frosty beverage. Absolutely, yeah, we're gonna have sports there. Um, and you can grab a beer or a, a soft drink or soda and sit there and watch other people play. We'll have all the sports on the TVs when we're in season. We'll, so it'll be, it'll be a social hub. Are you going to have a cigar lounge? Uh, that's not something we've worked out yet. Okay, you haven't worked that one out yet. <laughs> yet. So what do you think is going to separate this new facility from some of the other ones? I mean, it's got to be state of the art if it's going to be the, the world's you know, biggest one right now. Yeah, I mean, our, our status as the world's biggest club is the combination of the two sports indoors. So there are bigger pickleball clubs, there are bigger padel clubs, but nobody's really put this concept together. And doing that with the social aspect is, is something that I think will set us apart from every other dedicated club towards either pickleball or padel. I understand you're going to have some state-of-the-art uh, locker rooms mm -hmm. and facilities, so you can kind of come in in your in your street clothes and absolutely. and leave and leave clean. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We have full shower locker rooms. Um, we have a full service pro shop, and we have uh, pro staff there to help you learn the games, advance into a high level. We'll have events, we'll have tournaments, we'll have pro tournaments. It'll it'll be a full on schedule of activities at the club. Now, have you hired your, your pros yet? Do you have individuals that'll be giving lessons and you know how do you go about some of those things? We do. We have a head pro, Cliff Marsland, who will be starting April 1st, um, and he will be taking all the programming. We have several local pros who will be involved in the pickleball side. Um, and then out of, the, out of the box, myself and our general manager will be helping people learn padel and getting people on court also. Can you discuss some of the membership opportunities mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, what's your focus? Is there a target, uh, you know, individual that you're trying to get at there? Or is it open to anyone that can? It's, it's open to anyone. Um, we're, we're, we're going to limit the number of memberships to around 1,000 just to make sure everybody has equal access to court time and you get to, uh, you get to play as much as you want during the course of the week.
What about lessons? What if you want to come in and you know you're a novice, you're sure. coming in, or maybe you know it's girls' day out. Mm -hmm. You know they want to come in there. Is that something you can accommodate as well? Absolutely, we've got a full slate of um, programs for beginners, intermediate, advanced players. We have open play where people can just come in if they don't know anybody. They can come in and mix in with several people, and we'll introduce them and get them playing games together. Now, you told me before the show that you played a little bit of rugby mm -hmm. back in the day, and uh, the new general manager from this new facility is a, is a friend of yours that, that you brought in, and he's going to help lead a staff. And, you know, it's really important to have a strong staff, uh, you know, starting from the top. Absolutely. Um, Ryan Leslie is our general manager. He will be running the facility. Uh, he comes from a squash background. He's been very successful. He um, came from um, heading up. U.S. squash programs. Um, he organized the U.S. Open Pro events, all the junior and national events. Um, basically was their go-to person for national events in the U.S. Are you looking for employees and staffing right now? Because I know the, the big grand opening is coming up. Would you like to fill us in on the grand opening? I know the groundbreaking was, I guess, a year or two ago. Absolutely. We're, we're about 18 months away from, from, from our start point. Um, and yes, uh, we're hiring staff right now um, to staff the uh, front desk, the pro shop, and our bar. So we're always looking for, for extra staff at this point to make sure that uh, we're ready for our grand opening, which is on the weekend of the 24th and 25th of February, which we're about a week away from. Wow, that's amazing. So uh, this is perfect timing to do this. And if you talk about location, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a better location in the, in the St. Louis region than where this new facility is going to open up. Absolutely. Uh, we, we got lucky. Um, we managed to find a building that could accommodate the heights and the widths of the court and, and put in exactly what we needed. And it's five minutes away from Clayton. It's very easy access from Highway 40 and 170. Um, it's, it's an amazing location. So right off Olive and 170 and all of that. You know, I was thinking there used to be like an office max right there, but mm -hmm. there's a bunch of apartments going up. So it's another but another street up off of Price? It's just across the road from the new apartment buildings, the Clover, and uh, right behind the CVS. If you drive in there, it's Price Road, and uh, we're the first building you'll get to. You, you can't miss our sign. Well, any final thoughts before we let you go? Is there a website if someone wants to get more information about the grand opening, or they want to volunteer, or they want to get a job, or they want to participate? Absolutely. Uh, our website is padellandpickleclub.com. Um, the information on memberships there, our grand opening uh, dates are on there. And please connect with us on the info line if you're interested in, in working at the club. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us thank today, you. Mike. We really appreciate it. Cheers. Mike Puertas, thank you so much for what you've done. Thanks. I'm going to take a quick break, but when we come back, legendary KC95 DJ Randy Rayleigh will be in the house. Stay with us. We first met Todd, he was singing a song, and I was like, wow, look at this kid with the biggest smile. Todd's a joy. Yes. Todd's sir. really is a great joy. And you. Learn about adopting a teen at adoptuskids.org. There are so many reasons to love St. Louis, you can't pick just one. What I love about St. Louis is the 79 unique neighborhoods and 108 beautiful city parks, including Forest Park, which is actually larger than Central Park in New York, and the gorgeous Tower Grove Park right here. And there's always something new to experience, no matter the time of day or the season. So come and experience St. Louis. Brandon met a girl on a dating app. He finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. She must be a keeper. And welcome back to City Corner. I'm your host, Todd Blackstock. Joining us now is the Morning Drive Show host on Classic Rock 93.1 FM KBDZ and worldwide at... 
<laughs> uh, KBDZ, KBDZ got hum, you know. So. How about that? What I do, I do a lowercase Todd Rocks dot online. Yeah. But anyway, Randy Rayleigh's here with us, folks. Randy is the uh, the morning drive show for Classic Rock 93.1. About 13 years with KC95. Yes, and sir. I think, Randy, that's probably where you, uh, you cut... You know, uh, you got a lot of your experience and notoriety was, you know, that uh, decade or so over at Casey. Well, it was, and it was a great time over there. Uh, I came from Kansas City, and uh, uh, one of the things about it is that I'm not a native of St. Louis, but I've had cousins who have lived here all their life. And, and I remember when I would come down and visit my cousins, the first thing that we would do would be uh, when Casey comes in is tune in Casey, Casey turned me on to Jackson Brown, turned me on to Bruce Springsteen, and a number of important artists in my life. And so it was a, a kind of a pinnacle for me to get there. When I left broadcast to school, they had us get up in front of class and say where we were going to be in 10 years. And I said, I'm going to be doing afternoons at KC95. And of course, everybody laughed, but turned out that way. So I'm very fortunate. Uh, very, I, I'm very fortunate, very blessed to be in the right place at the right time. I'd say we grew up at a great era of, of classic rock yes, music. Did. Casey kind of came in right at the, the right moment with the, the albums and mm -hmm. they would play longer format songs and mm -hmm. things, not just the two minute Beatles songs all the time. And right. I think that really helped out a lot. Then he had the, the Sweet Me logo, which mm -hmm. was pretty cool. And people like Dr. Ruth Hutchinson or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, not, not Dr. Ruth. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's an iconic radio station. I had a great time there, and uh, you know, it was it was a wonderful experience. So, you're from the Kansas City area, and you've been a Chiefs you've been a Chiefs fan like your whole life. What do you think about all these people around the country, and especially in St. Louis, that are now Chiefs fans? Because we don't have the Rams anymore. What do you do with Bears, Chiefs, Tennessee? Welcome, Chiefs Kingdom welcomes you with open arms. I've been a Chiefs fan since 1969. I won $3 from my grandfather. I picked the Chiefs. He took the Vikings. I have been a faithful Chiefs fan. I have put up with three decades of really bad football. The Chiefs were the worst football team in the National Football League in the 70s and 80s. And now for the last six years, they've been the best. I wouldn't trade these last six years for anything. It's been a long, hard road for Chiefs fans. It really has. You probably liked it in the 80s when the Royals beat the Cardinals, but you were a Cardinal fan, though. I, the Cardinals, here's, here was my problem with the 1985 World Series. I'm a Cardinal fan DNA, DNA infused. My grandfather's father was a Cardinal fan. My mother's most favorite human being ever was Stan Musial. But I moved to, I moved to St. Louis in the summer of 1985, and there were a lot of my friends who were playing on the Royals. Larry Gura and Dennis Leonard and Buddy Biancalana and Buddy Black and all these guys that I knew because I was in Kansas City for such a long time taking on my all-time favorite team. So it was kind of a, it, it, it was kind of a struggle, but uh, you know, it is what it is. And uh, you know, um, it, I think it was great for both cities um, to host that World Series because it, it got to, uh, a lot of people around the country got to see what beautiful city St. Louis and Kansas City really are. Now, you've been in the radio business for, what, 45 47 plus years? years. And, 1977. Yeah. Yes. And so we've got some clips from back in the day. Oh, boy. Uh, in the early days of Randy Rayleigh in radio. We're going to roll some of those in. At what point in time did you know you wanted to get into radio? Uh, about 10 years old, uh, actually. I, I had a brother who was eight years older than me, uh, always had a transistor radio in his ear. And I was listening one day with my mom, and there was the local DJ doing on a broadcast and we were about three blocks away and I begged her to go see him. Name was Lou Gutenberger and he was a KSTT good guy and dude, he shook my hand and that was it. Um, I, I just fell in love with the business and, and many, for a lot of people, they listen to the radio for the songs. When I was growing up, I listened for the radio, to the radio for what was in between the songs. I always thought it was really cool that those old top 40 DJs could give you an entire story over a 13 second intro. And I just thought that was an incredible way to make a living. And uh, I, 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 I followed a plan to get there. And it, I've been very blessed. I've been very lucky. Like I said, I've, I've ridden the coattails of great radio stations. Well, when you're in high school, you're in the high school radio station. Yes, sir. We had a high school radio station. And as a matter of fact, that high school radio station gave me my very first interview that I ever did. And that was with Ronnie Van Zandt of Leonard Skinner. Because at the high school radio station, we played Freebird every Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock because the school was over. And, hey, I'm a free bird till the, uh, the next weekend. And so Skinner was coming to town, and nobody really knew who they were. And I got, uh, I got a backstage pass and got an interview with Ronnie, and it was, 
He was just such a sweet, lovely man. And uh, he just, y'all got a high school radio station? Y'all broadcast? <laughs> really? Well, that's just cool. So, and, and that was kind of the, uh, the, the beginning of it. And then got my first part-time job. And then I went to Muscatine, Iowa, and then the Quad Cities, and then Kansas City, and then to St. Louis. You know, you've interviewed some major celebrities over the years. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I saw a picture earlier of you and Yoko Ono. Uh, lovely woman. Um, in 86, um, she was touring with John's artwork. And she happened to be at the Joanne Purse Gallery out in Chesterfield. And Joanne knew that I was a Beatles fan by uh, you listening to me on the radio. And she said, would you like to interview Yoko? And I'm like, oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> might swallow my tongue or throw up on my shoes or something. And so we got the interview together. And, and I tell you, Todd, she was just as gracious and sweet and nice and lovely, a wonderful human being. Uh, we talked about a number of different things. And here's the nice thing I liked about her for like years afterwards. She'd send me a Christmas card. It would say, Randy, love Yoko and Sean. Wow. So yeah, she's, I just thought that was cool. you know, you think of Yoko as maybe she helped break up the Beatles and she got a bad rap. I mean, you know, she couldn't sing that great. Uh, I, I saw a thing with Chuck Berry and John and her and she started oh, screaming sure. this tribal well, love. Yeah. And uh, so she did, but that, that's, it's nice and comforting to hear that she's actually a really nice person. But she was a very nice person. And she just said to me, <clears> she says, you know what happened? She said, John fell out of love with the Beatles and fell in love with me. She says, what's so bad about that? And I tend to agree. Love is love. You know? I mean, he's been a lot of other, uh, other stars. Guy, Peter Wolf from the Jay Giles Band. That must have been cool meeting him. It was great. Uh, Jay, Jay Giles Band is one of my favorite. One of my favorite uh, pictures, though, is uh, uh, in 1984 when I was in Kansas City, the band Yes came to Kansas City, and they had just discovered American softball, and they wanted to put together a game. Where, you know, it was just a private game. They didn't want anybody there, but they just wanted to have fun for a day. I think they had a day off. And so uh, we did, uh, my radio station did, uh, did a whole day of softball with the guys from Yes, and it was it was just wonderful. So, I, like I said, I've been very lucky, been very blessed, um, you know, very fortunate uh, in, in my career. And you got to meet Alice Cooper at a, uh, a turning point in his life. Alice Cooper, I've met Alice Cooper a couple of times. One, the first time I met him, it was right before he decided met him? to quit drinking. That's him. You can just see that that's right before he, he quit drinking. He doesn't look very well there. He looks pretty sick. And then later on, I got to play golf with Alice Cooper, and uh, just uh, it was he was well and healthy and and uh, funny, and he cheats at golf. I can tell you. Oh, <laughs> uh, was that a was that a was that a five? No, 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 Alice, that was a seven. You know, so. my buddy Brian Satia has been on tour with him for like yeah. 10, 15 years. He's, Lovely man, he's a great guy to great work guy. with. Great guy, just a great guy, funny and witty and and very personal. How about Ozzy Osbourne? Lovely. Man. There's a great picture of you. It looks like you're having some fun in the studio. What are you gonna? Are you, are you choking him? Uh, I've 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 interviewed Ozzy three times, and he is just such a barrel of fun. He, uh, he is, you can ask him anything. He just really doesn't care. He has no filter. And uh, you have to have your hand on that, uh, on that dump button on the <laughs> microphone because you just never know. Uh, again, a great guy. Uh, I, I remember when we had him cut some liners for us over at KC. It would be like, Ozzy, this is a KC 95. And he goes, well, it was Ozzy Osbourne on... on and he just could never get it. And finally, he just got so frustrated, he'd go, Sharon! And <laughs> she'd come in, and it was great. No, lovely guy, and, and just uh, uh, really got what radio did for him, was really appreciative for what radio did for him and breaking him as in, in, into turning him into Ozzy. Now, after you left KC95, you worked at some other radio stations yep. around town, and you were very successful. You ended up retiring, and yep. you're happy in retirement. Happy and then one day, you're back in radio. How did you get back into radio? Can you well, tell us quickly? Well, I was retired, and uh, I didn't want anything to do with it. And I got a call from Donzie Communications. They said, uh, we'd like you to do the morning show. And I said, no, nah, I don't want to do it. I just tired of corporate radio. And they said, look, you know, we trust your judgment. We'd like you to do the morning show, do it the way you want to do it, and, uh, uh, you know, program the music for the morning show. It worked out so well that now I'm programming the, muti the, uh, I'm programming the music for the rest of the day. Uh, I'm the morning guy. I'm programming. I'm, I'm selling. I'm, I'm doing all sorts of stuff because I believe in radio still. But it seems to me that small-town radio is the radio that's going to save the genre uh, it, uh, we're very involved in the community and, uh, you know, we play the music that the boomers are into and, uh, it's just been a very good fit for me. 
Um, I'll probably retire again for good someday <laughs> here. Uh, but for right now, they've made it having fun again. I'm having fun again. It's, uh, it, it, it's fun to do. It's not a corporate thing where everybody's clutched down on me. Uh, they actually ask my opinion. Oh, what's up with wow. that? You know, and so it's been a good fit for me out getting out of retirement and doing this. I wouldn't do this unless it was fun and it's fun again. So you get to do live remotes, you do a little play by play here and there. And uh, let's talk about your Internet radio. I know you uh, helped out that scene a lot. And uh, before we go, I want to talk about the preservation of Classic Rock Society, too. The Internet. I have an Internet radio station that's a part of a nonprofit group called the St. Louis Classic Rock Preservation Society. And I'll be very brief about it. About six years ago, the FCC decided to pull the rug out of a lot of basement broadcasters, a lot of web basement broadcasters. They made the royalty rate so high that that only the big companies could uh, afford it. So my friend John Seven and I, we had competing internet radio stations. We decided to join forces and, uh, and put together a nonprofit organization. And those nonprofit organizations are under a separate uh, category when it comes to the FCC. Our royalty rates are lower than most, and it's a, a flat rate across the year. So we have allowed uh, about six or seven different webcasters to join our nonprofit organization. And what we're trying to do is we're just trying to preserve St. Louis classic rock. There's a certain feel about St. Louis classic rock. There are bands that have made it in St. Louis that have, you've never heard of anywhere else. And so we're trying to preserve that. But if you go to our website, you'll find a big selection of radio stations. It's like a internet radio station jukebox. And uh, again, that's allowed us to keep broadcasting when other webcasters haven't been so fortunate. And you have some cool events coming up, or you, you know, you do in conjunction with that society. I mean, you have like dinners and things and Hall of Fame voting. And right, we have our own Hall of Fame, uh, St. Louis uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, we do uh, a trivia night each year, and we do uh, a number of things that raise money for the organization. And uh, again, we wouldn't be able to broadcast uh, free uh, music through your computer uh, if we didn't have this organization, I'd like to you know, tip my hat to John Seven and the board uh, for doing such a great job and keeping us a, being a viable nonprofit organization. So Monday through Friday, yes, sir. Classic Rock, 93.1 FM, Six. KBDZ. You can probably get it on Alexa and some uh, other things now as well. You know, I'm, I'm not well versed on that, but uh, I can tell you right now that us boomers still like our FM. 93% of the boomers still listen to FM every day, and uh, while the other demographics are and other stuff, we've still got our FM. And, and like I said, I'm humbled and proud and very blessed to be a part of the St. Louis radio scene after all of this time. Well, you certainly are a legend. Randy Rayleigh, thank you for joining us here today on City Corner. My pleasure, Todd. Thanks so much for inviting me. Appreciate you. All right, folks, that's our show for today. We especially like to thank Mike Puertas and Randy Rayleigh for joining us in studio. We'd like to thank you for watching STL TV. Experience St. Louis.